Welcome to EOD TV's Real Time Conversation. We're here with old friend Bern Grush. Bern, welcome. Thank you. I'm so, I'm so happy to be here. This is such fun. It is. And we've already been talking a, a bunch. And we're going to, I'm going to share a screen here because this is what got the conversation started uh, many, um, a couple months ago. Uh, I was on one of the local uh, social media sites, if you will, and someone had taken a video of a, a little sidewalk robot running around our neighborhood. And in our case, the sidewalks aren't really sidewalks. So this little guy had to uh, had to drive on the street. And uh, and actually, there was uh, some, there were some funny comments, like this one person uh, suggested that it was uh, a little alien and uh, asking if it wanted to uh, take uh, take one to its leader. Um, and of course, I referenced our interview with uh, with Byrne from a couple of months ago. Um, and I thought it was appropriate to catch up because, uh, Byrne, you've been uh, doing some things uh, uh, lately. The Urban Robotics Foundation, I want to talk to you about that. Um, you know, before we get into that, maybe uh, we should talk briefly about the kerfuffle in the uh, in Toronto, as, as I called it, um, the kerfuffle, but I don't know if that was it. But why don't you kind of set that up? Because that kind of leads to, I think, the general discussion about what you're doing with Urban Robotics Foundation. Yeah. Well, the city of Toronto, and this is, this is independent of the foundation, um, uh, came to a point after several years of operated, I, I don't know, two or three years that a company was operating, it was a company that operated uh, food delivery robots. He was operating, this particular person was up or company was operating, I think four or five or six at once. In other words, his entire fleet was probably less than 10. In any case, they were delivering sandwiches and lunches in certain areas. Um, I, I've seen them in a couple different areas. And, and at one point I saw them on, at, on the campus, the University of Toronto campus, anyway. Those small robots were on the sidewalk and that operator, that company, the CEO of that company had gone to either the city or the province, the province of Ontario or both, and said, I'd like to operate these vehicles. Uh, is it okay? Because he's got a, a machine without a human. It's, it's radio controlled or it's called teleoperated, but it was going to go on sidewalks. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't have motorized vehicles on sidewalks, uh, like bicycles, for example. But he asked for permission. And they said, well, we're not sure, like, we don't understand the implications of this. So, you know, try it and, you know, we'll let you know. We'll see. Well, he did that and he built a little business. And I don't know if it was profitable or not, but he, he got from two to four to six to seven robots. And it was getting an enormous amount of good press. People loved them. They called them cute. Everybody. At some point, uh, it came to pass that the uh, accessibility community said, wait a minute. Are these going to be dangerous for um, uh, persons who are blind or, or especially if they're uh, with a white cane? Uh, and what about wheelchair? Will wheelchair users be able to get around? Or will they be disturbed? And so on. Now, those, those questions, by the way, are not foolish questions. Uh, there have been circumstances where people in a wheelchair in Pittsburgh were blocked. Uh, there's been, there's been a, a, a reported case of a woman who was both deaf and blind, uh, complaining that, well, how will I know where they are? I mean, and in her case, she had a helper dog, but there's no, dogs don't, the helper dogs are, have no experience with these. You can imagine they could be trained for them, but but they're not. And so that was a problem. And then she again had a problem. It was, and her second problem was these device. I can't use these. I'd like to use this device to bring food to me, but I can't because my she has special software on her phone that help her with many things, and her software doesn't know about these devices. So partly she was saying she wasn't saying they were bad. She was saying. They're not integrated with my life. They're not integrated with my helper animal. They're not integrated with my soul. That's not the same problem as the first problem in Pittsburgh where they said it blocked my way. It's like they, they, that, that robot didn't understand wheelchairs. Now, it's easy to have. It's not easy, but it's possible to have the teleoperators deal with that, to move aside and so forth. 
anyway, that all of that was not addressed prior to Toronto City Council being asked to halt the use of these vehicles on our streets. And the City Council met and said, we need to ban them. At the same time that City Council was saying that, the province, independently of this issue, was saying, you know, we need to start paying attention to these sidewalk robots. Many states are looking at it. We need to understand what, what are our cities going to do? So at this, these two issues independently of each other came to play at the same in the same few weeks. And there's always friction between cities and provinces as well between cities and states. So all that, all that political friction and all the, the accessibility, all that came together at once. And this city met and said, we need to ban them. And even during those meetings, they said, okay, we're not going to ban them forever, but we're going to, we're, we have to cease using them until we understand what we're doing. So step one, let's find out what we're going to do with the province or not. That's still undecided. Uh, and then when it becomes decided, we need to study and have pilots and so forth. So that's why if you, if you read my report about that, you'll see me argue that the city council was right because the city is not prepared for these. At the same time, most people wanted to see the, well, the people who were shop owners that want to have this as a delivery service, people who are using them to get their, uh, to get meals and, and the, uh, the operators who were operating them. So the majority of people wanted them, but the city council was faced with a very tough problem of people saying, well, you know, what about accessible? And one person, one counselor said, when there's a possibility for uh, mischief, there's a possibility for a, a terrorist to use them. And I, again, I point out there's, there, there's no evidence yet, but that's not a ridiculous point to make. I mean, we know always any technology is, is, uh, gets misused, it gets abused. So that's why I'm, I, my point is it was correct to ban them. It's not correct to ban them forever and they weren't. They weren't. It is we need to have regulations, but we need to have standards for those regulations. So if you don't have standards, then how it's going to unroll in Toronto is not going to be how it's going to unroll in New York or how it's going to unroll in Atlanta or how it will be in San Francisco. You need to have a body of standards so that the machine makers can comply with the standards, that, that the city councils can look at each other and say, what have you done? What can I learn from you? And if we don't have standards, cities can't learn from each other and, and we're gonna have multiple different uh, manufacturing standards that increase the expense of everything. It's, so the, the technology cannot be successful without standards, no, no technology. And I'm talking about- That's what you're doing with the ISO standardization effort you're leading, right? Well, that's the whole thing. Like, yeah, my work is the my work is drafting the ISO standard, and the purpose of drafting the ISO standard is to create just what I just said standards that municipalities can look at and say, "Here's how we're going to operate. Here's what we want. Here's here's how we want these systems to be managed in our city." And we're going to the language of how to say that and the procedures to be used are in the standard. And so the idea is that. A standards in place for municipalities to speak to manufacturers and manufacturers know what to make and know what to do or know how to negotiate with cities and, so, and the logisticians know what to do and the planners understand what to do. Because at some point, and, you, and again, you said this earlier things you've done, our infrastructure is pretty rough in a lot of places. We have many, so you just showed a picture now that there's a sidewalk with a, a, a street with no sidewalks. So what happens if there's a street with no sidewalks? So you showed a picture of the robot just going down the street. Is that okay? Do you want a robot just going down the street? Uh, I suppose you don't. Uh, I have in my neighborhood many streets with no sidewalk. In any case, even when I have sidewalks, they're very narrow. I have sidewalks that two um, wheelchairs cannot pass each other. A wheelchair can pass a person, a person can pass a wheelchair, 
uh, so I'm saying, uh, excuse me, a pedestrian, a, a, a mm -hmm. ambulatory pedestrian can pass a pedestrian in a wheelchair, but uh, but two wheelchairs can't pass. So they would one would have to pull over or pull off or pull onto the lawn or pull onto the driveway or just get out of the way, and so on. How are robots going to behave in that way? So you can say you, you can imagine setting the rules, uh, but I might set a slightly different set of rules than you, and, and that's not going to work. We need a common set of rules so that why not to alleviate the complexity for the robot operators, which is a very important thing, but it's more important that when I visit your city and I see a robot approaching, I understand what's happening. I know it's gonna wait for me, or I know it's gonna to go to the right, or I know it's gonna to go to the left, or I know it's gonna flash its lights. And if it doesn't do what I'm expecting it to do, I'm a little confused. Like, did that robot see me or not? Like, I'm not comfortable because it's not behaving like they behave in my city. Like, I'm okay with them in my city, but now I'm, now I'm confused. It's the same experience when I went to South Africa, I, born and raised here in North America, and I'm used to cars on the right-hand side of the road. So when I cross the street, I jaywalk all the time, arrest me right now. Uh, <laughs> I, when I cross the street, when you're, when you're in a country that people drive on the right, I'm crossing a two-way street, I first look to my left because cars are gonna come from that direction. So that's clear, I'm clear that way, good, I'm clear. I look back again uh, and I cross. When I was in South Africa, you have to do the opposite. And I couldn't do it. I came to the street and I looked to my left and the cars are going the other way. It was very, so intellectually, I understood, but I'm not crossing the road intellectually. I'm crossing the road using almost an autonomic system. It's, I cross the street almost like I digest food. Like I just, I, I've been crossing streets for 50 years. So I know which way to look. I couldn't cross the street in South Africa. It was it was horrifying. It was like what, what? And I had to control myself and say, "Got to look the other way." And it took me three days to be able to cross the street in South Africa. When I come to your city, I don't want to be confused by your robots, especially if I have an issue with sight or hearing. I would be terribly put out. If I uh, was, if I were blind, and your robots are not behaving the way my robots do, so these are all very important things to deal with. And here's my my warning: if we don't have orchestration systems and we don't have traffic management systems for all these automated vehicles, I don't care what kind, passenger or goods, and if we don't have behavioral systems, how does a robot behave? So it's not just you know, they have to have brakes and they have to stop at the intersection. How do they behave? We don't have a behavioral system for cyclists. We say, you know, cyclists have to stop here and go there and they're allowed to do these things. But we don't, and, and we, we have something of a signaling system that a bicyclist ought to raise their hand this way or that way. But that's not, um, uh, that's not, um, what do you call it, um, standardized or it's not followed. <coughs> All of that put together is uh, contributes to lots of accidents, uh, and and it's you know it's these standards that we need that to reduce those accidents and to make uh, such a system workable. Hey, I pulled up this slide because it seems to uh, just kind of summarize your points as far as what the robots uh, need to do to yeah. work in society with people. I suppose. Absolutely. No, it's the safe, consistent, and understandable, which is what I've just been talking about. Orchestrated, orchestrated is the traffic management part. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is there an opportunity to, um, for, for, uh, cities, uh, you know, and again, I can't speak for all the cities in North America, but clearly a lot of the ones I've been to, the infrastructure for humans, especially pedestrian humans or people, humans on bicycle, is kind of subpar in many places. So by introducing kind of this new form of transportation, will that be a forcing function to improve things for everyone? Thank you, I hope so. Uh, thank you for recognizing that. I, I noticed that a while ago and I don't say it often enough. Well, I do say our infrastructure is inadequate, but because delivery, because logistics and delivery are an economic, commercial and required, I mean, we need stuff. I mean, you can see behind me, 
half of the stuff that you see behind me came to me from Amazon delivery. You know? So we need those things. We want those things. So to your point, it may be the case that the requirement for competent uh, traffic flow of logistics management using more than just a roadway, using uh, shoulders, bike and lanes and uh, footway, and sidewalks, uh, that might be a forcing function to have us improve. That's why I mentioned earlier, planners are important in this because I'm an advocate for widening sidewalks. It's a big deal to widen. It's very expensive. You have to move trees. You have to move utility poles. It's a complicated problem to widen sidewalks. But when you widen sidewalks, how wide should you make them? Are you going to have a little or a lot of logistics in these spaces? How should you share that space? I mean, there's arguments that many people make an argument. You need a separate space for robots, separate space for bikes, separate space for walking, separate space for wheelchairs, separate space for bus. And so you have a, a throughway. A, a transportation way, you need like separate space for six or seven or different vehicle types. Well, you don't have space for that. Almost, almost no streets can afford that. It's simply not there between the buildings. So the other argument is make a single open space for everybody and then very, very low speeds. Cars going at, you know, 20 miles an hour and, every, and everyone else is sharing that space, looking out for everyone. And the argument is it's actually safer not to have separate spaces. Now, I'm not going to say which way I would argue that because I don't know enough to argue that, but that is an unsettled problem. And I think we need to have a very hard look at how to do that. And that's why planners would be involved, traffic planners and infrastructure planners. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of um, the way telecom networks used to be built as single purpose networks. You had a telephone network, you had a cable TV network, uh, yeah, data networks, they're all separate. And and now they've consulted, and, and that meant, you know, multiple infrastructures. Now they've consolidated on internet protocol and you can put everything in the same pipe and each one kind of gets prioritized yeah, based on. Excellent. Again, an excellent analogy. Excellent analogy. I mean, you can, you can take that analogy back to, you can take that analogy back to rail, for example. So we have, in my area, we have, we have, Rail that's operated by um, Canadian National CN, Canadian National Railway or CNN, whatever. Not CNN, sorry. Anyway, we have two rail. Uh, CP, is it? Sorry. Is it CNP? C, 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 CPR is one of them. Oh, okay. And, anyway, anyway. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off no, the point. I've, there. I've actually worked for both of them, but it was so long ago I can't remember the acronym. Anyway, the point is that there's there's massive national rail systems. And they'll have some rail that's purely for goods because they're moving oil, they're moving, they're moving. Uh, it's all it's just for it's just for goods transportation, and separate rail for passenger transportation. I mean, it's complicated mixing these things because of switching the accidents. The last thing you want to do is have an accident uh, in any rail circumstance, but you surely don't want to have an accident when you're carrying hazardous goods or when you're carrying passengers. But imagine paired together. Imagine having. So there's a lot of reasons that these rail systems are separate, just like telco used to be separate. And there's that's the same reasons people say, let's have bikes lanes separate from passengers, separate from robots and so on. So that, that separation versus consolidation or, or, or integration is an unsettled, unimaginably difficult problem. Now, the standard doesn't say which way it should go because the standard doesn't have, it's just out of scope for the standard to make such a, take such a position. The standard always says, given that you're doing this, given that you're going to have these, then you need to describe them and manage them and, uh, and you need to have a way to have a traffic management system. If you look at air traffic control, for example, air traffic control doesn't say you can't have a plane bigger or smaller than this or that. It says, if you're going to have a plane that goes this fast, you must have this much lead time in between in between landings, or you must have this much road uh, runway width for this purpose or that purpose, or you must clean the roadway this often or that often. So it's not a matter of dictating the machines; it's dictating the infrastructure and the and the schedules and systems and control systems that manage those machines. Same thing with the standard; it is for uh, it, on the left here the various governance elements, again, traffic and security, privacy, and so forth. It's about safety and uh, 
you'll see the point social justice. In other words, have we addressed um, fairly the requirements of all the users to be a, to be had, have reasonable access to the value of the technology? It's not just that only that they're safe, but that it doesn't leave them out in any way. As I, I, I mentioned, um, uh, there was a, one person who happened to be uh, blind and uh, deaf. Her complaint was that her animal, her helper animal, didn't recognize these devices. So ought there be, ought there to be some effort to have a way for helper animals to recognize them? And she also complained that her apps that brought her food couldn't co collaborate, couldn't integrate with these systems and so forth. So all of these things are, all of these things are important. You'll see planners, and I, of course I've mentioned logistics operators uh, have to, here's one thing, that logistics operators have to schedule in advance. When you're receiving, let's say you're receiving a FedEx package and you get that at your business at 10.30 in the morning, that was planned previous night at two in the morning or to previous uh, seven or eight or nine hours ago. All the, and, and it can be actually planned even in, in greater advance if you consider the schedule from where that package originated to the time it gets to you. So now I'm gonna schedule a truck. I'm gonna load, tr load a step van in the morning with a hundred packages, including yours. And I have to, I, I set out a route for my driver where that route's gonna be and what order I put the packages into the vehicle and so forth. So I can't change the sidewalk access schedule or the bikeway access schedule for a delivery robot at the last minute because you this isn't this isn't just you know for me to get a pizza i'm not worried about me getting a pizza i'm worried about fedex delivering 100 packages and they have to schedule they have to know that ahead of time so i so for example the standard says that you have to give seven you have to give several days lead notice that the municipality sets that lead. We, the default is seven days. Uh, and a, a municipality may say three or a, or, a, or a FedEx might say 14. And that can be negotiated between FedEx and the municipality. But the standard says you have to, you have to give lead time before you- Just lead time for a time slot to- Well, it could be- Lead time for time slot is one thing, but one of, so one of the parameters, for example, one of the parameters is throughout your entire map, you say how many robots can go on a block face at once or in a single segment. A segment might be a piece of a bike lane between two intersections, that's a segment, or it might be a sidewalk between two intersections. So that the map has how many vehicles can use that segment at any one time. So between, between uh, 7 and 10 in the morning, no robots can use that infrastructure. Be between 10 and 3, four robots can use that infrastructure. So that's in the map. That's in the standard map. You can't change that because the, the goods operators are relying on that, on that schedule to, to use that infrastructure. So we say, well, we decided to change it from 10 to 3. We tried to change it from 11 to 2. You need to give advance notice on those kinds of things. It's also the case that we're gonna have construction. So if we're gonna have planned construction, I can't tell you when your robot is on that sidewalk and say, oh, sorry, you shouldn't be here. We have to tell you that a significant amount of, a significant period of time so you can plan. It's also the case that the system provides for what we call trip tickets. These are, these are immediate permissions. So it, an operator says, I want to go from A to B. And okay, here's how you're going to get it from A to B. And here's how you must behave while you're getting from A to B. You must go at these speeds and you must not carry hazardous goods and you, you know, whatever it is. So there's 30 or 40 behavioral rules while you're going from A to B. I can't change those rules at the last minute. Because in fact, uh, one of the states, this is an, an interesting example, one of the states in the US permits the carrying of ammunition. <laughs> Some states say that uh, ammunition is a hazardous good and some states do not say that. So imagine that you're in a place that 
permits that, and now they decided not to permit that. You need to say that in advance, not because of people who want to get their ammunition, but for those companies that have a business delivering things, they need to know that they can no longer deliver that. So they need to tell their customers, their shippers, I can no longer deliver this these products. Uh, since the, um, the number of drop-off slots is kind of fixed in this scenario, um, and, and there is probably peak demands and so forth, do you see some sort of auctioning system evolving or something to value the, the time uh, you know, and the, uh, the location of those particular slots so that they're valued properly since it's a, kind of a public good that's being used in an individual basis, in a sense, for private delivery? 110%, 110%. So the standard does not describe auctioning. It's out of scope. By the way, it might, it might be later. I mean, there's a lot to be finished first. It yeah. might be later that... Working. It might be later that uh, such a standard is written, but at this moment, it's out of scope. But you'll see on, on the under governance, you'll see the concept of monetization. Monetization can be several things. It could be exactly what you said. We're going to monetize these, these slots, these robot slots by, uh, by, with an auction. So that's a form of monetization. We're silent about the form of monetization, but the standard permits, sorry, excuse me, the standard enables monetization. Why does it enable it? Because the standard has a map, which is like all the places that you can or cannot move on, or you can or cannot use this sidewalk or this bike lane or this shoulder, whatever. And it, because it, I, I mentioned earlier that the orchestration system provides a trip ticket and a trip ticket says, you're going to go on this, this on block A, B, C, and D uh, to make your delivery. Uh, and you've been given that and you can charge for that. You can say you're going to go on block A, B, C, and D and the charge for each block is such and so because I might charge two cents on this block but I might charge 12 cents on the other one because there's more traffic on the other one or go back to your idea because of the way that slots have been sold. And so you can use that but because you didn't purchase that permission you have to, you can't go, you can't go now. You have to wait 20 minutes before you can go and you have to pay this amount. So you can sell slots and then you can monetize per, per segment or per block phase uh, or not. You can just say, we don't want, we just, you know, you can go and uh, use what you use. And so it depends on how much control a, a municipality wants to have. So from a, um, a use perspective, you are only looking at it autonomous or teleoperated vehicles, is there, do you think, a, a, a need or a desire to bring in other kinds of vehicles into the conversation, whether they be human driven, whether it be vehicle, you know, traditional internal combustion engines or like cargo delivery bikes? I noticed that, you know, th those were some of the comments in your LinkedIn. Someone mentioned, well, you could do this via cargo delivery bikes, for instance. Yeah. yeah. I, first of all, I, I prefer cargo delivery bikes. But that's because there's there's a there's a healthful job. I mean, a job where you're cycling, there's exercise, and and it's it's both clean and it's it's a healthy thing. If you have a job delivering pizza in your car, uh, there's kind of a double. There's two negatives with that. Uh, in any case, um, your question is, does it need to be automated? The answer is no. There's nothing about the standard. For example, there's nothing about the Robo taxi aspect of the standard, because we've been talking about sidewalk robots just now, delivery robots. But part of the standard is about is about robo taxis, and there's absolutely zero reason that it can't be used for ride hailing. There's no, it does not anywhere prevent or or uh, it's not this. The standard is not disabled in any way by ride hailing. It's simply the, that the goods delivery can be bodies or boxes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say it again. Oh, the goods delivery can be bodies or boxes. They could. They. They. They could be. Um, the problem is that there's so many rules about behavior rules. So, for example, there's there's rule there's rules for robots that the, again the, the final decision is with the municipality. But there's a rule about whether you travel clockwise or counterclockwise on the block. It seems like a bizarre thing, but 
if you if you can only travel clockwise, then you don't have bots coming in both directions. So if you are a pedestrian, and I don't care whether you have a disability or not, but if you're a pedestrian and you know the robots are always on the outside, always traveling clockwise, if you if you know that, then there is some again that comes back to understanding. So I understand where these robots are. I'm not going to be surprised. Right now, when I walk on the sidewalk, um, I will see a cyclist on the side. It's not legal, but I see a cyclist on the sidewalk. And often it's a, it's a kid 10 or 12 years old, and I don't blame him. If, if I had a kid that young, I liked, I'd rather that be on the sidewalk. But nonetheless, I see them coming at me, and I can know what to do. Sometimes a cyclist passes me from behind and scares them. <laughs> It scares the heck out of me. So I don't want I don't want robots to alarm people. I want I want people to understand and expect and know what to do and so on. So that's one of the reasons that that one's in there. So um, anyway, just there's a lot of rules like that that they just don't apply to humans. You're not going to you're not going to tell the uh, what's it called the DoorDash delivery person that they have to. I mean, you already tell them don't use your bike on the sidewalk, but they do. And so now if you're going to use your bike on the sidewalk, you can only go clockwise. It's, 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 impo- it's, it's not remotely thinkable. Forget it. They're not going to make the three rights to, t- to turn left, right? <laughs> no, they're not going to do that. But the robot doesn't care because, and then, you know, you're, you're getting your pizza six minutes late, but you don't know that and you don't care um, and, and so on. By the way, there's now somebody working on a, on a robot that, cooks your pizza on the way very clever is that ridiculous or what well you can't stop innovation and uh, you know the standard is silent about it the standard couldn't care less what, what what's in the vehicle right and, uh and, and if you're going to if you're going to prepare your pizza in the vehicle uh because you're going to have it hot when it gets there fine uh i don't care but but you can start to see you can start to see the, the potential value to consumers is so high that the, the demand for more deliveries increases and this whole problem be, get, gets out of hand, right? This um, it reminds me of uh, 20 years ago in the um, video on demand conversations, always had to have pizza mentioned at least once. So, yeah, um, <laughs> so we, we uh, got that quota. Um, and this was an interesting chart here that uh, is in your deck that um, uh, talks about the progression of, of governments. I, do, I just I want to put in, if I knew this was only about pizza, I wouldn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be emergency vehicles. There's going, to be, there's going to be so there's going to be I know it's there's going, be, there's going to be so many other things that uh, that uh, and then, you know, I'm in this for the pedestrians, actually. It's, it seems odd that it looks like I'm in it for the robots. I think the robots are coming and I'm in it for the pedestrians because I'm, I'm a pedestrian and I am finding our sidewalks inadequate in every regard and I'm fed up with cyclists on our sidewalk. I am not happy that robots are going to add to that. But I know they're coming and I know what to do about it and that's why I'm doing this. Anyway. No, that makes sense. I mean, if you can improve the walkability, then uh, that helps. Uh, that helps the pedestrian, right? That's what I'm up to. I'm up to. I should probably say that up front when people look at our site. But the thing is, I want cities think, "Oh, what am I going to do about robots?" The log- logis- logistics people say, "I need to use robot," and they and the planners, "Oh, I need to plan for robot." Everybody's everybody's robot centric. They're robot. They're robot focused, and so. I happen to be pedestrian focused, but if I say I'm pedestrian focused, none of the robot focused people pay any attention. I have to get their attention. So it looks like, you know, this is something that in effect, effectively you're trying to influence uh, everything from the local to the national uh, scene, both here and I guess internationally. Well, nor- this is this is the normal standard sequence. You write a standard, here's a, like, here's a vehicle safety yeah. standard. And so we have a national vehicle safety code and so on. And then we may have, for example, you have a, you have a national safety code and it's something about seat belts and a state code or provincial code says, okay, here is the fines for not wearing a seat belt. And here is our, here's what we're going to do with our police force to, 
watch people wearing seat belts. And, and here's what we're are not allowed to do. Allowed. So for example, we, underst- we all understand what a red, a red light, what, is, what does red light mean? Is an international standard. What is the frequency of a red light that makes a red light a red light? I mean, it's not a pink light. It's not a, you know, it's not a maroon light. It's a red light. It's a very specific red. And so that's an international standard. We adopt that in every country. And then, then we have rules in the state and the province and the region that says, if you go through a red light, here's the fine. We are allowed to have red light cameras in our state. We're not allowed to have them in that other state, for example. And so Toronto had, for example, municipality Toronto had red light uh, cameras and then they didn't have them. And then now they do have them and they, they are allowed to send you a bill, but they're not allowed to send you demerit, all that stuff, all through the range from what is a red light all the way to what does the city do? So it's the same thing with these robots. What is, what is a sensible understanding and the language and meaning of the robots? Oh, let's adopt that in our country. Let's have the Netherlands adopt this standard and they will write their own national code. So will France, so will Spain, so will England, write their own code. Then let's go by the states and the provinces and the regions. They'll write their specific code because they want to talk about, for example, they, a jurisdiction might be building infrastructure. So if they're building infrastructure, they say, well, we have to have monetization to pay for the infrastructure. So a jurisdiction, for example, Ontario could, uh, th- just using this as an example, Ontario never said this, but the province says, we're going to permit them we're, and we're going to advise you. We're going to write a, a provincial code for sidewalks that's a better provincial code than we have now for accessibility. We have a provincial code for accessibility. We have a country code for accessibility. Cities are not up to date. If you're going to have robots, we have to extend that code. And we're going to say you cannot run robots if you don't match that code. Now, I just made that up. Mm-hmm. That's what I hope states and provinces do. Because 22 states have already said there shall be, ro- there shall be a delivery robots in our state. And they shall be permitted in your city. You can control them and manage them. You can, you can, you can uh, govern them. But you can't say no. That's why the the city of Pittsburgh, when the state of Pennsylvania said there there shall be robots, you can't say no, you can manage them. The city of Pittsburgh immediately started a pilot, understanding what they are so so that they can set some rules. They can set time of day. They can set speeds. They can do what they, they can do, those kinds of things. And somebody in that city said, we were taken off guard. The state made that rule. We didn't, we were not ready for this. And we know that, that that state Senate bill tells FedEx and tells UPS that if they want to, they can operate. So FedEx is going to say soon, we don't know when, in a few years, we're coming in to deliver using robots. What are your rules? Well, we don't have any rules, so you can't come in. So, well, no, no, no. <laughs> We've lobbied for this. Give us your rules. We're coming in. And so that's the kind of that's the kind of negotiation. That's, this is what the this is what the next decade looks like. These kinds of things. So why did I say in this in this guideline we are so far behind? The technology is so nearly ready, and it's and it's it's look it's operating commercially in, in several cities already. I know it's only operating with thirty or twelve or fifteen vehicles, and in, in Milton Keynes in England it's operating with almost two hundred, but. 200 robots is a tiny number. What do you do in San Francisco when there's 1,500 from FedEx and 300 from Uber and 700 from there and there's you know, there's 4,000 of them? So we're not ready for that. And we I don't think we're going to have the time to go through these national and jurisdictional codes. Some cities are going to say, we need to have rules now. And that's why I have the anticipating government government. Some cities are already looking at the drafts. And first of all, the code's in draft form. It's not yet ready for use. It will be ready for use in about 18 or 24 months. And when that's ready, cities are saying, We're, we, we have to go now. We can't wait. And so they'll do whatever they do. And it'll have to be adjusted over time. But that's, that's the process that we're in. This yeah, and that actually, maybe that's a good time for you to talk about what you're doing with the Urban Robotics Foundation, because it, it seems in my cursory reading of it that you're bringing together 
uh, municipalities are bringing together robot manufacturers, bringing together all the players who would be interested. In it. Yeah, there's, there's about, um, there's approaching 30 members now. Uh, there's 10 or 12 cities. Each member has their own interest. So a municipality's interest is how ought we to consider governing this? A logistics operator is saying, how can I get my machines to operate in these spaces? A planner is saying, what, what do I have to do? What do I have? To do? So I, I have a new project over here. We're going to redo all these streets and sidewalks. Should I be making the point that this sidewalk ought to be wider and take another lane away from tr whatever, whatever? Should I argue that or not? Because I have pressure to keep the, I have pressure to keep uh, street parking. I have pressure to keep the, uh, basically, I have pressure to keep the through lanes. I, I went, I went three through lanes, whatever, whatever. So, uh, and that's the planner. Uh, there is sitting uh, with us three people. Uh, there's somebody from the Canadian National Institute of the Blind, specifically concerned about uh, behavior and volumes. Like the last thing they, the last thing you want, for example, here's a, a nightmare scenario, is that you are crossing a street, and you're a, uh, you're using a white cane, and you're at the intersection. Now, there's always other people at the intersection, but today there's 13 robots at that intersection, as well as three other humans and you. Not a good scenario. So how do we control that volume? So that's one of the things that uh, interests uh, people that, uh, that, are, that, ha that have accessibility concerns. So that, those are all the members, and each member has their own interest. You can appreciate that. So the, the role of the URF, the, the Urban Robotics Foundation, the role is to bring these people together saying, this is going to happen. How can we make it work for you? If you're, and so I gave an earlier example that uh, some, the, the person from the Canadian National Institute of the Blind said, you can't have robots traveling up against the building because we train white cane users with something called shorelining where you, where you walk along beside the buildings you find landmarks there with your cane, but you know where you are in the block because you recognize the building or the steps or whatever it is. You know, here's the, 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 the newspaper box or so on and so on. The bottom line is that you can't take away that negotiation tool by putting robots on that pathway uh, and so forth. And so what do we need for, what do we need for um, uh, logistics operators. Oh, we need advance notice. We need two weeks. If you're going to change it, we need, we need to know where construction is two weeks in advance. For example, uh, nobody else does, but the, but the, but the logistics operators do, for example, and the plant and so on. So everybody has their own requirements. Which, which then feeds back into the whole system because, uh, you know, if uh, there's a planning notice or whatever, somehow that needs to be transmitted to these logistics. Yep. And, and I can imagine just, Given my limited knowledge of the way municipalities work, a lot of that stuff isn't digitized in their back end. So yeah. there's a lot of work to be done, I would think. A, hu a, a huge amount to be done. And all we can do, so I want to make sure that listeners understand the standard is naming the data elements needed. They're saying we need, we need to have these metrics, these, but we need to know these things. And here's the procedure, for example. What is the procedure if a, if a robot is crossing in the crosswalk? So every intersection, not every, an intersection, a proper intersection has a zebra crossing, a pedestrian crossing with those white lines that you are to wait for a, a green light. And then you are to proceed, you know, look and proceed across the intersection and go to the other side of the intersection and mount the curb and go back on the sidewalk. Now, if you are disabled, and you're using a cane to get through that space, for example, it needs to be clear. It needs to be that uh, in my province, we have something called right turn on red. So right turn on red means that the driver of the vehicle that would like to turn right looks to see that the, you know, the crosswalk is clear. Not always. Sometimes they jerk out in front of you and squirt on their turn to the right because they're rude driver. But you know, they, they have those behaviors. Now you are crossing the street and you are sighted and you hear and you see, and you can wait or that car stops for you. They, they block the pet and they stop for you. They whoop, I have to wait for you. You might go around the front of the car, like in, like into the edge of the traffic lane 
because you've made eye contact and you trust that the driver actually sees you and is not going to run over you. Or you say, you know what, this idiot's blocked my way. I'm going to go behind this car. And you go behind that car. In between two cars, there's another car behind them trying to go right. So you decided either to be rude to that driver, to go in front of them, or to go behind them. Or you might foolishly wait in the center of the intersection. Or you might even go back to the other side. There's lots of things you could do as a pedestrian. What does the robot do? None of those are good ideas for a little robot. The little robot, you showed me the picture of that little short robot delivering a pizza. That If that robot were in such a circumstance and it went in front of the car, it wouldn't necessarily be seen. It would get run over. It goes behind the car. It wouldn't be seen. If it turns around, it goes back. There's going to be another car turning right at the other intersection. That robot is going to be, that robot is going to be probably destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, that, no, that's right. Exactly. I mean, it, uh... that, that guy cannot do any of the behaviors I described. So I described that to one of the cities that's a member. And they said, I, I said, I don't know how to solve this problem. I mean, I can describe the problem, but I don't know how right. to solve it. He said, it's easy. We can solve that. I said, what? He said, remove right turn on red. I hmm. said, whoa. I said, you're not going to have any complaints about that? He said, we're already thinking about doing that because that's why we have a rising pedestrian death. Right turns on mm -hmm. red kills pedestrians. So I said, can you blame it on the, can you, can you do it only for pedestrian safety? He said, yes. I said, thank you. Don't do it for robot safety because people want human safety. People want cars to be able to move. People want pedestrians to be able to move. People don't care about robots. So don't blame it on robots. So he said, no, no, it's a, it's a pedestrian issue. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I can see if you're like in a, a, a big pickup truck or something, you might not even see this little the guy. No, you, no, you wouldn't. It's not even your fault. You, I mean, it's, it's the fault of the, of the world that made you buy a big pickup truck. But, but <laughs> Yeah, but it would just, you know, you'd just look beyond the, you wouldn't even see it. Yeah. I mean, look at that. That is, that is, I mean, what is that, like a Honda Civic or something? That's yeah, it's not a big car, yeah. Well, you understand that a pickup truck wheel is almost twice the diameter. Yeah, exactly. If this, if this were already here, in front. To exaggerate a little bit, that robot would fit inside the tread of that truck. <laughs> right. It's, it's not even – if if I if I were a pickup driver, I'd say, do not have these on my streets. There's no point for these. They're just they're, – they're not even a speed bump. Right. And right. so – and they're going to happen anyway. So, so these are the these are the reasons that we need to collaborate with this. You you cannot you cannot have these systems. I'm not you you you, you can't have them legally, physically, uh, uh, operation. You can't have them in any way. This is an unworkable problem unless you collaborate. Yeah, and you know, to uh, you don't want to also crush the innovation because we don't know what will come about i mean these might be delivering uh, medicines for uh, a shut-in or something who otherwise wouldn't necessarily be able to get them or you're i think you pointed out on linkedin a few months ago an autonomous uh, snowblower right i mean what a godsend that would be uh, uh, to someone who's stuck in the snow or whatever yeah yeah no no there 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 are look every technology that has good value has problems i mean the smartphone has enormously good value and it has lots of problems. I'm going to say social media has huge value and huge problems. Atomic energy. You can't name, you cannot name a, uh, a technology that only has good things. Yep. Water, water has problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you got to have it and it has problems. <laughs> so there, so robots, uh, I, I'm an advocate for the, for the, for the technology working, um, you know, because it's small and it's clean, it's electric, it's it, and so on. I'm not an advocate for 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 15 minute delivery for everything. I mean, I when I order something from Amazon, I wish I could tick a box that says "take your time." I buy Prime. I bought Prime because I went to movies, but it's a trap. Now I I have to have same day. I don't need same day delivery. I don't need. I can have that book ten days from now, but I get it tonight. <laughs> One thing that that I don't know how much you've explored, and to some extent maybe out of the standard, but just this whole idea of these robots actually, to some extent, being able to re revitalize or help local 
uh, merchants compete with the Amazons. Is well, that? Yes, I, I wrote a whole I wrote a whole conference paper about that, just about that issue, and that is that uh, retailers, local retail, like a local community retailer, your city has fifty thousand people, and there's a downtown with 120 retailers, all the way from a dentist to, to a burger shop, the whole range of businesses that are in your downtown. And, and a portion of those can deliver stuff to you. The hardware store could deliver to you, the, the, all the food shops and so on. And those predominantly shops have been, have been threatened by uh, the box stores. They've been threatened by the, the assumption that if I can't park, I can't shop. That's not a good assumption, but people feel that way. So I, I'll go out to get free parking at the at the mall, and so uh, the e-commerce in the last decade, and especially in the last 36 months, e-commerce has shot up because of COVID. So you can you can add the pandemic to that, but it's really about e-commerce and 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 the box stores. These robots can help. They can, but they can they can help they can help revitalize the downtown in the sense that we can we can bring business to these local operators. One of the com problems is that the revitalization of downtown is not just that the burger shop sells more burgers, but it's actually you went down and saw other human beings. So if you're not going down and saying hello to the shopkeeper and taking your laundry in and saying hi to the laundress and, 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 and talking to the cashier at the drugstore, that's socially is missing. And that, that's actually one of the concerns, right? I mean, that movie from Disney several years ago, right? I mean, uh, does this make us just more insular and no need to ever leave home type of thing? Well, one of the things that you can do, could do, is you can actually have robots become social agents. So, for instance, in a tour, like these are, there's many small towns with a small tourist area. So during tourist season, people come to visit this lovely little downtown. These are cities with only... 15,000 people and they have a little tourist district and there's business there. Well, you could have these, you could have these robots do things like see people and, 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 and say things to them. Did you know that so-and-so has a sale? Would you like a brochure about such and so? Did you know we're, 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 uh, the, the lake has a wonderful trail or whatever? You could do things like that. I'm, I don't think anybody's planned to do that, but there's no reason that a, that a robot could not have a social role they already have monitoring and surveillance roles. Well, I was going to ask you on the surveillance role. I mean, it seems to me that this it is a roving camera and clearly there are concerns about privacy and things like that. But it also would be an opportunity, you know, to maybe make things a little bit if people know that, you know, there's you, you the eyes make, on the bottom. You could make things safer. That's 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 for sure. But so one of the, one of the things that the standard deals with privacy is that is that the the machines need to see where they're going so they're using cameras and they're recording it they may need to have proof that they made the delivery so they might need to say i was here at this time and i delivered what i delivered and you might need to keep that because maybe there's a payment going on i have to prove that i delivered especially if i've delivered something substantial and especially if i'm delivering ammunition and there's an event and this government says i would like to have that data please and show that you delivered what you were and so on and so on. so there's lots of reasons that the data has that has legal accounting and appropriate value but at the same time i could be selling those recordings to you because you would like to know where to set up a you'd like to know where to set up a coffee shop right. so i sell those recordings to you exposing business activities that are private to those business operators, giving you a leg up that you don't deserve to have because you're, you're, you're trying to put whatever a chain of things in places and it gives you a, 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 an unfair competitive advantage. And so how do we prevent that? All the standard says is how long you can keep the data. It doesn't, the standard, the standard can't say you're not allowed to do that. The standard can say you can keep the data this long and you cannot release it unless there's a certain point to releasing that data. But that has to be set by the municipality. Or remember, I showed you those government, it has to be set by the jurisdictional level or the, so the, like the, the, the national rule is you cannot sell data or, or the jurisdictional rule. That has to be set 
at that level, it can, the standard can't say that. Standard is always metrics and procedures. Every standard is like that. I mean, the standard for the standard for the for the for the the bolts on the back of your toilet seat. When you if you want to change your toilet seat, there's two bolts that hold the toilet seat. There's a standard for that that width. There's only two. Thank the goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you can you can order a, a new whatever that is. You can you can order a, an O ring for your for your sink because you're going to because it's worn out. Well, and you order a size so and so, it exactly fits. Right. That's all ISO standard stuff. And but nobody said what you should use your sink for. <laughs> you can wash anything you want to in there, legal or illegal. <laughs> but 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 that O ring fits. So I'm up to I'm up to those level of st standards. That's and, well, that's excellent. The everything at, at, and the kitchen sink in this case. Yeah. Um, People have said to me, "Oh, we shouldn't use sidewalks." Okay, don't use sidewalks. That's not up to that's that's out of what you should or shouldn't use is out of scope. So, and so I, I love to tell this story. People have said, "Well, put them in the bicycle lanes," and I've said, "You're not a cyclist, are you?" <laughs> <laughs> so nobody wants them in their infrastructure, but we all want them. We all like we all use. No, nobody likes trucks. I hate trucks on the road, but I want the stuff the truck brings to me. Everything behind me was in a truck. This chair was in a truck. Right. Well, and while we were talking, I thought of another use case of uh, you know an automatic, uh, automated like pickup or flatbed back bed truck that would just drive to my house. I could throw on some furniture that I was trying to get rid of, and it would just take it away. Right, and I wouldn't have to go to rent a truck and all well, that stuff. There's already automated. Uh, uh, there's an uh, automated follow me uh, technology. So the the person, a, the garbage truck follows the person with an electronic tether. And so you don't have to get in and out of the truck all the time. You just walk, you walk to the next can and then you have a robotic arm that puts the can in. But a person is leading the garbage truck down the street on foot. I haven't helping seen that. Very clever. Helping out when they're stuck. But, but the, the truck follows the person and the truck picks up the garbage can. But a person is is you know, mediating all of those activities, but it doesn't have to get in and out, which is silly to get in and out, in and out, in and out, because you, you move like you move seven feet, you get out, do something and move seven. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's where things could start to get interesting. I could see yeah. vehicles like that special purpose vehicles because of, uh, you know, automation, because of electrification, you can do things maybe in ways that you wouldn't otherwise, you wouldn't be on the same schedule that you would be in a, uh, you know, have to cover the same area because you can build to what you need. There's a, there's a company in the Netherlands that has built a robot that picks up cigarette butts. Nice. Now you, you, you still don't want to trip over that. You still, you still need to, you still need to provide that robot with a route to say, okay, you would like to clean up these streets. You can go and you can clean those streets up at these times. Because the last thing you want to do is have somebody tripping over a, a small box okay. cleaning up that. They've now they're now developing one to clean up gum. Oh wow! Gum, gum has there's a little there's some kind of a chemical spray and a, some some kind of a mop up whatever it is. Gum is uh, I didn't know this, but gum is uh, is an environmental hazard. It, it's it's about twenty five percent plastics, and they I eventually they, they eventually wash into your into your uh, water sewer rainwater systems. And eventually end up in your rivers and lakes. Wow! So when you spit your gum into the ground, you're because nobody thinks anything. They just spit their gum out on the ground because it's just going to. Well, it doesn't disappear. It, yeah. Well, that's good. To, good to know. Well, that's another great thing I've learned from you and today. The solution to that is not swallowing your gum. The solution is that is don't chew gum. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> that's not going to that's, not gonna, that's a big industry. Anyway, so there's so many. There, I don't know that there's a limit to the kinds of things that these robots could do. I, I, I walk along and I see oh, there's all kinds of things that could be done. What you know, I walk down the street during garbage collection day. There's garbage cans all over the sidewalk, which is a barrier to robots. But you could have a robot. You could have a robot move them. Mm -hmm. The robot could stand them up and put them at the edge, for example. Because what happens is we have a robot arm on the truck. It 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 empties the garbage and it just plops the can right. on the street. When the, when the when the when the grasper opens, then it tips over. 
or, it, or, or whatever, and the wind blows them around. There's so many things robots could be designed for. Do you ask an engineer, could you make a robot that could move? Say, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, and, and you know, again, back to your uh, snowmobile removal, right? Now you're actually improving quality of life for people because you're clearing the sidewalks faster or, and, you know, maybe they wouldn't have been cleared otherwise. Maybe they're not slipping on ice. That same little Dutch robot that, that, that does the cigarettes, that same robot, it's a very clever machine, that same robot can, has an attachment for brining, for spraying salt, salt water. Ah. So you can go down your street. Now this is for, you know, when the snow is almost nothing or when it's icy, like after a, like a rainstorm and it's icy, so you wanna, you wanna put salt on it. And so it does that. It doesn't plow snow, but it, 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 brining is pretty important because you can, you can have a lot of times of the year where sidewalks are slippery and dangerous. Uh, it doesn't need plowing. It just needs ice. It just needs salting. Yeah, yeah, that makes and sense. And those machines could be designed to minimize the amount of salt. So when salt spread by hand, by by shovel, I I remember last year I went to it was a heavy snow, and I was walking past a transit stop. So the a truck with a human a pickup truck, a human stood in the back and shoveled shovels of they just threw shovels of snow at the transit and they were uh, they shovels of ice uh, i mean shovels of salt shovel, like. shovels of salt so i was walking through and it, the salt was like three or four inches thick it's like because it, it just clobbered clapped and, and it was it missed that and it was caught it was just a really horribly in, in, inaccurate and suboptimal well I got it. I, I had a, a man driving a pickup truck and a guy in the back of the pickup truck. And we got, we had, the, because people were need to get into the bus. What are we going to do? And we just don't have the equipment for that. Cause you, you would say, well, let's get out and let's spread salt nicely. Well, we don't have the time and expense to spread salt nicely. So instead of spending the money on that extra labor or machine or whatever, we spent more salt. Where did the salt go in, in my city that goes to Lake Ontario. Yeah, and then it rusts out all the remaining vehicles, right? Well, it, well, but that's good for the automotive industry. See, Ontario yeah. makes cars, so the best thing for Ontario to do is to rust out their cars, sell more cars. Sorry to be sarcastic, but there's there is so many suboptimal things going on because we we don't have the money or systems to do it the right way, and there's motivation to do it no. No one's planning to rust your car out to sell you. But it, it does remind me, though, of the um, – at CES, one of the things I interviewed John Deere and their new uh, Sea and Spray. Uh, they have these 130-foot-long arms on it, you know, that, that's literally looking out this, uh, this sprayer thing, and it looks for the weeds and only, uh, you know, yeah. herbicide there. It only fertilizes where it needs to. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fantastic machine. Yeah. But, but aren't they upwards of a million bucks for one of those machines? Oh, I'm sure it's expensive, yeah. <laughs> but it's more to your point about being able to only put the amount of salt you need and where you need it versus yeah. Yeah. shovel. Well, what you need, so you need to build those machines. So if, if I were a farmer, I, I was raised on a farm, and my we we cut our own hay. with our We had our own machine to cut our hay and our own machine to rake hay, but we did not have a machine to bale the hay because there was another farm, because we were all small farmers with 20 or 30 or 40 tiny little farms. So you couldn't afford a bale. You only used the baler twice a year. And at that time, like we're talking about in the mid fifties, I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was a 30 or $40,000 machine, which would be $400,000 today. Cause it'd be a much bigger machine. But anyway, a, a neighboring farmer bailed all the other farmers. And I remember my guy, my dad would pay him like 25 bucks to bail our field. And he made a living bailing fields. Interesting. So that machine you described I would invest, I would borrow, I would buy that machine and I would and I would weed everybody's everybody's lot. But what's cool about that, in order to in order to run that John Deere machine, because all those aisles of the, the lanes of vegetation are, are fixed, you have to plant that field with the John Deere machine, unless you have a standard. Unless you have a standard. If you don't have a standard, so John Deere has to plant it, has to harrow it, has to weed it, has to harvest it. And if you can get that machine and just change the fixtures, just change the uh, armatures, you've got something. <laughs> yeah, they've, uh, I think they've got the software too. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, and that's the industry you want to be. So you want to you want to invest a couple million bucks in all the army, all that stuff, and you contract to your local farmers, and basically, you're the you're the 
automated operator that that handles all these and and, and it, since the automation isn't about you not riding in the cab although you don't have to ride in some of them the automation is that you don't make mistakes while you're riding in the cab yeah because you can't perfect you can't, quality right well you're gonna have a you said 130 feet uh, how many how many uh, how many that's going to be like 15 aisles on each side whatever that is you can't make a mistake you take yeah, out a lot no, of you take out a lot of crap, a, a lot of a lot of your crop. If you, if you, yeah. if, you if you, anyway. Well, we've gone from uh, sidewalks to, uh, uh, I guess, farming all in one uh, conversation. So Santa, Santa, Santa doesn't do farming. We're 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 only in public pedestrian <laughs> spaces. We don't do inside hospitals. We don't do mines. None of that stuff. It's far too complicated. We're, ju we're just handling the easy problem of sidewalks and bike lanes. <laughs> well, I've, uh, I always appreciate catching up with you and getting an update on, on this. And I'm sure we'll be catching up again in several months just uh, because this thing keeps moving. Oh, it's going it's to keep moving.